Good evening and welcome to tonight's episode of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamandunga Kumalo. This is episode 10 of the podcast. And this evening, I'm joined by Michelle Cohan, who's going to be talking to us about how to increase the value of your property. And now, of course, this topic is actually quite a hotly contested one, especially given, uh, you know, the time that we're finding ourselves in and how We've been saying that it's largely a buyer's market, but in the same breath, there are probably going to be some distressed sellers. So Michelle is going to be helping us you know, better understand valuing our property if we want to sell, um, and also just making sure that you don't outprice yourself too much. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us this evening. My pleasure. Good to be here. So I think, Michelle, I mean, before we even look at some of the more cosmetic changes that one can potentially make when they want to increase the value of their property, it would be remiss of us not to actually look at where we're currently finding ourselves right now in the property market. I mean, there are probably some um, property owners who very likely may have valued their property suppose three six months ago and they're probably sitting down and thinking the value of my property is very likely not going to be what the value was three or six months ago how can we you know if you could just help us kind of decipher that and even help people at home understand that there definitely is going to be um, an impact on the value of their property right now given the global crisis that we find ourselves in Sure. So the truth is that nobody really knows where our market's going to be once our lockdown period is over. Um, it would be silly of me to even try and assume what kind of property values we'd be able to put to properties once the lockdown period is over. But I can tell you what is currently happening um, in the market with, with, our, with our portal, with our website, with our inquiries. People who viewed properties uh, two, three, four, five months ago are now coming back to the agents online. My agents are all still working virtually, as most are. Um, and they're saying, you know, I saw that property a few months ago. I've just gone online. I've had time. I've looked at it virtually. I see the price has gone down a little bit. I'm keen to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I think the fact that the interest rate has, been, has um, decreased twice in the last month has a huge impact on the fact that property will still sell. But on the other hand, it's going to sell at the correctly priced uh, uh, mark in the current circumstances. And what that mark is, nobody knows. Your property needs to be listed. You need to have a really good agent who is giving you continual feedback in terms of what people from the portals are saying. And judging by what the buyers are saying and the kind of buyer activity, even in this market now where people are sitting at home and looking online, that's what's going to indicate how our property prices are looking after the lockdown period. There's definitely more movement in the under 1.8, 1.9 million rand price range. The lower you go, the more activity we're seeing in terms of interest. And interestingly enough, we've actually had one or two offers that have come in. Uh, people did see the property prior to lockdown. The sellers were reasonable. They dropped their price a little bit and the sale happened. So, we're still in a market where property is going to happen. There's no question about it. And, you know, Michelle, if you can perhaps give us a sense of um, how the percentage that these properties are going down by, you're saying that there's, um, you know, quite a significant movement in the properties below 1.8 million. Are, you know, are sellers going down by 5, 10% or more? Um, or, um, and how much are the buyers asking for less? So when they're interacting with your agents, you know, how much, how bullish are they in trying to negotiate for a lower price? Prior to the lockdown period, I found the whole of last year, property prices were selling for between 30 and 40% lower than what the asking price was. So that, that's a substantial amount to come down. But that was also prior to the interest rate decreasing. And that's also very much in the market that my company works in, which is the market from about 750 up to about three and a half, four million. Um, the market above that wasn't moving at all, from what I understand. Um, so I think what we're going to find is now just speaking to our sellers, if they are motivated to sell and they actually have a reason that they want to sell their property, they are going to sit and they are going to listen. And they are, if they have confidence in the agent that they're working with and they can see the person's really doing what they need to do, they will hear what the, what the agent is saying. It's all about the motivation to sell. 
you know, if someone doesn't need to sell, they're not going to take less for than what they feel their property is worth. Now, if you're just joining us at home, I'm speaking to Michelle Cohen, who's the franchise owner for Leapfrog Johannesburg Northeast. And we're talking about, uh, you know, how to increase the value of your property, but really more specifically looking at pricing your property. I mean, we're currently in a very unprecedented time property-wise, certainly for a lot of us who are now in the property market. And whether you're a seller, you're trying to, you know, establish what the right price point for your property is, and perhaps you might potentially destroy seller um, perhaps you're not a distressed seller you're already contemplating selling your property um, and if you are a buyer and you want to be interacting with your estate agent we want to better understand you know the value of a property and some of the things that both parties need to be considering as they make um, that decision if you've got any questions for us on this topic do ask us below and we'll be sure to answer some of your questions now Michelle you know I actually want to look at um, perhaps if you've got any uh, tips for sellers in particular, right? Because I think oftentimes we've tended to find, and perhaps not so much in the past in the past year, because it has been a buyer's market for quite a significant amount of time, even prior to the lockdown. But you tend to sometimes find that there are sellers who, firstly, overprice their property and then don't want to go down. So even when I uh, suppose the estate agent has, you know, had a sit down, they've, you know, they've looked at the house and they say, I think you've overpriced your property and the property stays on the market for a relatively significant amount of time. What tips would you give to a seller, um, especially at this time? And, and let's assume this is, of course, a motivated seller. So not somebody who has the luxury to kind of sit and wait for the perfect offer that may never come. Um, what kind of tips would you give that kind of seller in, in, in helping them price their property the right way? Well, the most important thing really is to sit down with a qualified career estate agent who can show you data that's pertinent to where we are sitting now in the property market. The good estate agent who specializes in your area will be able to show you the transfers that have registered. And you must remember, we're now a little bit behind because the deeds office has shut one thing and another. But the properties that have registered previously, but they'll also be able to tell you exactly which properties in your area have sold and the price that they've sold for. And that's, that information is more important than the information that's coming from the deeds office because that's giving you an indication of where the market was transferring prior to lockdown. So a good estate agent will know the houses in your area. They'll tell you that house sold, that house sold, there's a sold board, this is the price that the seller achieved there. And that's really a very good indication of where the market is. A lot of sellers look online and they, and they look at the price that is being asked for a property. And they notice week after week that price is coming down and down and down and down. And they wonder why that's happening. Well, it's happening because the market is not responding to the, the initial price that you were asking. So a good estate agent coupled with common sense is what's going to give you a good indication of where your property is worth is. So one of the questions that we've got coming in is from Lena Davis, and it actually touches on what you've just, um, you know, briefly outlined. And Lena asks, can we have uh, steps on how do we have our property evaluated? Well, that's, yeah, that's a good question. And Lena, we can now evaluate properties virtually. Um, the good estate agents have got themselves very geared up to working remotely. So what you need to do is you need to contact an estate agent in your area that you're comfortable with, and you can do it online. Go onto your, to your local um, private property portal, put your area name in, look at who the agent is who's selling in your area, maybe phone two or three agents, tell them where you live, take some really nice photographs of your house, because obviously during lockdown they can't come and view, but take 10 nice photos of your house, email the photos to the agent and on that basis the agent can send you back a virtual evaluation and give you a good idea of where they think your property should be priced. You know we've listed properties that we've started marketing that we haven't seen yet that we've evaluated on that basis and by listing them and putting them online we're starting to see already what the response is and if the buyers are comfortable at that price and that's a very good way and those are the good steps to start in this current market. Once the lockdown period's over and your agent can then come over and view your property, 
They can then give you information about what kind of interest they've had on now on the property, and that gives you a really good indication. They're now physically seeing the property, you're meeting face to face. They can give you advice on, on what kind of um, interest there was in the property. They'll show you some statistics, the online statistics, and then you can make a very good educated decision in a couple of weeks' time after lockdown's over. I think, you know, Michelle, it actually gives us a, 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 an indication perhaps of where the industry is going. I mean, if we're already being able to virtually evaluate or have our properties evaluated, I've seen even a rise of um, virtual tours uh, that are on the rise. And we even see some right here on privateproperty.ca.za where, you know, estate agents do a virtual tour of the place. Uh, so you don't have to, you know, you don't have to just look at pictures alone. Um, but also there's also the rise of having online Online auctions, so not having to go to an auction house in order to do, in order to participate in an auction. I think some of them are even using platforms like WhatsApp to make sure that they're keeping up with the auction. So the property industry is also finding itself having to use different ways, um, different digital tools uh, to essentially respond to the global crisis, but also potentially where we are likely headed, you know, in the future, where a lot of times maybe we might even get to a point where um, people who are slightly more seasoned might want to buy properties without viewing it themselves. Uh, and I must say, you probably need to get to being seasoned before you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> And not you the property you buy. Um, so Michelle, I think another one that I probably have to look at is suppose then you are not a distressed seller because I actually want us to almost differentiate between somebody who's a distressed seller because they are more likely to be slightly more negotiable than somebody who's got a bit of you know time um, on their hands. Suppose you're not a distressed seller and you're somebody who has a property and you're probably looking at you know offloading it. Um, and, and I know you were saying earlier that, you know, we can't reasonably predict where the market's going to be. One thing that's certainly been um, quite clear, certainly from some of the guests that we've also had on the Private Property Podcast, is that it's going to stay a buyer's market for quite a while. Um, so I think sellers are going to probably have to find interesting ways to make their particular property um, uh, I mean, lucrative or enticing to the next person. What are some of those things that then sellers can do to make it slightly more enticing? So if you're looking at two relatively um, identical apartments, let's say both are two bedrooms, two bathrooms, they're the kind of area that you want. How do you then kind of make the one better than the other? So it might not necessarily increase the value in terms of rents, but it might potentially get it sold at your actual price point and faster than the next apartment. I just want to go back to something that you said earlier with regard to people putting offers in without, virtually without having seen the property. Yes. yes, you do need to be a seasoned buyer. There's yeah. no question about that. But also, if someone is buying for an investment and it's a rands and cents decision, so they're investing in an apartment, they know what the costs pertaining to that purchase are, they've done their homework, they know what kind of rent they're going to get, you know, they can buy that property just kind of virtually and, and not stress too much once they've done all of their homework and looked at everything. But if you're going to live in a house, you need to walk in and feel it. So I agree with you on that one. Um, back to the question that, that you asked me now. If you have two properties that are next door to each other, that are offering the same thing, and you, you're working virtually and you're working online, obviously the look of the property if it's an online virtual tour that you're doing, really has to be attractive. And the photographs have to be good. You know, it's better to work with a company that's going to send a professional photographer out to do a video tour, to do good quality photographs. Make sure that when the photographer comes through that your house is really in photo shape. You know, you wouldn't go on TV without your makeup. Don't let your home be shown on a portal without, without it really being at its absolute best. Put the washing away, put the dishwashers away, put the loose seat down, all of those things. So that's the one thing you can do. The other thing that I think is a really good idea, particularly in this kind of market where people are going to be more and more stretched financially, is to have your home inspected by a home inspector. If you're living in an older property um, where people may be interested but would like to know what they're buying. If you have a home inspection report from a, from a certified home inspector as to the condition of the property and the chap down the road who's selling his house, same age, same price, 
doesn't, I think that that really does give you the edge because a buyer has a level of comfort that he knows what he's buying. In terms of sectional title apartments, where they are very similar, it's just really about the presentation. Online presentation, how your photos look, who the person is who writes the advert. When you're looking through the portals, don't go with the estate agent who's making spelling mistakes and not giving good descriptions. You know, go with the people who are putting in what are the levies, what are the costs pertaining to the property every month. Present your house as professionally as you possibly can online. Because the person who's presenting it like that online is going to present it like that live. Um, so I think that just having it look presentable, be nice, be clean, be fresh, it really takes you that much further. The other thing is don't go and spend a fortune on repainting and fixing things up. Because there's no guarantee that you're going to get that money back. Make the house presentable, keep your yard tidy, sweep up, make it look good, but don't spend fortunes of money fixing things because the chances are the person who buys your property is going to come in and have a little bit of money to spend to make it their own and repaint the house and do whatever it is they want to do. And it's so interesting that you say that, Michelle, because, you know, oftentimes or in certain occasions, uh, you know, one of the tips that gets given to prospective yeah. sellers or people who are selling is to do minor renovations, right? Whether it's painting a place um, or even, you know, maybe redoing the kitchen or the bathroom, which are actually quite significantly expensive. I think those two rooms are... See, yeah, sorry if I can interrupt you there. There's very big differences. In, in those two things, to do little minor repairs, to paint your gutters and repair them, that adds value. To if your boundary wall is really, really shoddy and you don't have street appeal and your garden has weeds, fix those things up. But don't go and repaint and go through big expense and redo bathrooms and kitchens because the person coming in may not pay you for that and they may want a different bathroom and a different kitchen. So they might not see value in what you've done. And I suppose, I mean, if I look at kitchen and uh, bathroom renovations, I've recently done that for, for one of the properties. They're quite, they're relatively pricey to do. Yeah. So if you're going to be doing it, it's either you've got, you're going to be selling it at a significantly, you know, high amount and you're confident that you'll get it. But if it's just a normal apartment and there are quite a number of those on, like, on the market, then it certainly doesn't make sense to spend all that money that you could probably use as a deposit for another property if you'd like. Remember, if you're at home and you have any questions around valuing your property, if you want to sell your property or perhaps looking for a property, you can send your questions to Michelle and I and we'll address them tonight. Uh, we've got a few comments actually coming in um, this evening, Michelle. One of the comments is from uh, Michael Fanica, who, who actually says, a good indication of correctly priced property is private property stats. If you have not received any inquiries within five business days in the middle market section up to 2.5 million, there's only one problem mainly, given the condition and location is decent and that would be that pricing is wrong. So don't factor agents commission on top of the selling price. Sales values um, in your area includes agents commission. And perhaps that's something we can talk just slightly a little bit about, Michelle, is mm -hmm. where you're pricing your property and it's probably a topic we're also going to be talking about tomorrow about the different costs that go into selling a house but be because it's just been touched on right now when pricing your property perhaps help us navigate the 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 commission that of course as the seller you'd be paying your estate agent should you be pricing it in or should you just budget for that amount you do need to price it in, and there's a few other costs, but you're covering that tomorrow night, yeah. so I'm not going to necessarily go into that. But you do need to have that evaluation with the estate agent who will price all of those things in. So you do price the commission in, because the amount that you put your house on the market for is the, um, the gross amount, so it's the amount before the commission is taken off. What happens after that is if you're selling your house for a million rand, and you get the million rand for your house, um, the, the estate agent's commission comes out of that million rand if they're getting 5% plus VAT, the 57,000 rand will come off that and you'll get the balance into your account. So you must always remember that you do need to factor the agent's commission in. And when you sign a mandate with someone, I'm a big believer in sign mandates because you then agree on a price, you agree on a commission, everything is in writing, there can be no dispute after the fact, and you understand what your net amount is. 
Um, and that's something very important. The other thing, please, if you're going to sell your house, you need to give your bank three months notice. They need that 90 day notice period so that you don't have a penalty. So there's different things that you really need to get good advice on. Um, and when, you, when you're factoring the commission in, a good estate agent will explain to you exactly how to do that and what your net amount will be after the commission's paid. But all the homes that you see online that are being advertised by an estate agent are inclusive of the commission amount that the seller has agreed to pay the agent. So the net price to the seller will be less than what that commission is. And I think then... Uh, less than what that asking price is. Apologies. Yeah, and I think, I mean, one of the things we're definitely going to be looking tomorrow at the cost of, or the different costs that go into selling your property. So do tune in tomorrow evening, uh, right here at 7 p.m. where we'll be looking at some of them, because I think sometimes you may want to sell your home, but you don't actually understand that there are costs involved in selling your home and what those various costs actually are and how you can go about understanding what each and every one of them are. And even the responsibility that falls on the seller side and the responsibility that falls on the buyer side. So do watch out for that episode tomorrow evening. Another comment coming in um, is the downside of pricing is that sellers go for agents with the least commission percentage, but they sign a sole mandate when their property is overpriced. Price um, counseling is vital. So if the price, so price it correct and you should achieve at least 90% of the asking price. Buyers know more as the industry is more transparent than ever. So give me yours and I'll, and I'll prove it. So of course, and, and that comment is actually quite interesting that, you know, sellers will sometimes go for agents that have the lower um, percentage and not understanding that that's not necessarily where the biggest value um, is or where you might necessarily get the, the best sale at the right mm -hmm. price or get it as quickly as possible. So if you can just help us understand that the lowest percentage isn't always necessarily the better option to go for as a seller. So a lot of the time, the, what you actually pay your estate agent for is their skill. It's their negotiation skill, their experience, their understanding of the market that they're working in their ability to effectively communicate with people. In essence, it's their confidence in their own ability to market, negotiate, and sell your property for the best possible price. So the question then really lends itself to this. If the person undervalues themselves as they walk in the door to get business from you and cuts their commission as they sit down opposite you, how do you ever have confidence that an offer that they bring to you has been well negotiated? Because that really is what part of a big part of what the estate agent's job is. Um, I'm always a believer that in life you get what you paid for. And mm. if someone comes in straight off and is prepared to just negotiate and work for you at 50% of what the recommended estate agency affairs board tariff is, when they bring you an offer, you have to have a question mark in your mind. Could they have bought me more? Did they just go the easy route? and get the first offer they could get and take it and not try and sell my house or not try and negotiate me something better. Because when they initially came to see me, they sat down and they said, wow, I'll take three and a half percent. That's my business model. Mm. You know, there's easy and there's uh, efficient and they don't always go together in the same sentence. So I think you must also look at what the offering of the estate agent is. If a person's online presence is professional, if it makes you feel comfortable, if they sit and they make sense when they talk to you, you can be sure that when they're representing your property and negotiating on your behalf, they will have exactly the same attitude. Because at the end of the day, you both want the same thing. You want to get the best possible price for your property from a willing and able buyer. And a person who goes the easy route may not necessarily do that for you. And we've got more questions coming in. Remember, if you're watching us at home and you've got any questions around pricing your property and navigating the right way to go about pricing your property, do send through those questions and Michelle and I will be um, answering them. We've got one here, Michelle, from Kolani uh, Tiam, who asks, Hi, Michelle, how do we solve a problem of a seller who doesn't want to meet a buyer halfway? You put in a lot of efforts to bring the buyer in to put an offer that is reasonable, but the seller will refuse. Hello, Kolani. I know you personally. Um, thanks for the question. <laughs> I 
How we resolve that issue is the first thing we do is we ascertain, is our seller really, really selling their property? Do they have a motivation to sell? Are they testing the market? Are they happy to stay there for the next five years till whatever it is till the market recovers? And once you've ascertained that reason, then it makes, you, it, makes it much easier to know where you're going to go with an offer. My experience has been when we've presented offers in the last eight to 10 months, each time we've presented the offer, the seller has kind of been very um, despondent with the price. And in the initial offer, they've kind of said, you know what, even if they had a good motivation, we're not accepting this because the market changed too quickly for what the sellers to, to accept. Um, what I found is that when you have a relationship with your seller, and when you keep on going and talking to them and showing them, as the previous guy said, the stats, the online stats, showing them these are the people I bought through your property, this is what they've said. When the seller sees that you've put the work in, they take cognizance of what it is that you say. And when you sit with them with an offer that's a really good offer from a good qualified buyer, you've then got a little bit of experience. It takes time. People want to know you've done the best for them. So they may sit with you with the third offer that you bring them and say, well, you know what, I can see you've really worked for me because now you've kept them updated. It's not a quick process. It's not a quick story that we just bring people offers that they want and the offers are closing. It doesn't work like that. The seller wants to know that you've really done your best for him. You want to know that you've done your best for him. And often it takes a little bit of time for the seller to get his head around where the price needs to be. And our job as the agents is to have the, the patience and to have the professionalism and to have the negotiating ability to be able to close that gap between the seller and the buyer to make it a good equitable situation for everybody. And it is quite an intricate one because in as much as, uh, you know, the, the seller would have been the one who gets, gives you the business, you're also working in the interest mm -hmm. of the buyer. So it's not either or it's literally you're the middleman who's meant to uh, come together and make sure that the interests of both parties are met as much as possible now michelle you know another one Sorry, is perhaps can, the one can, I, can i interrupt there i think yeah. that that's why that home inspectors report is going to particularly after lockdown become a more important um, negotiation tool mm. i think that when your seller has shown good faith that he's gone and he's got a report on what kind of property he's selling. And when you sit with your buyer, you say, you know, we've got a, a completed disclosure document. Our seller has told us, you know, everything about his house. But over and above that, he's had someone in who's checked all the things that we can't see. We didn't come climb into the roof and check the roof trusses. We didn't look at the geezer, but he's had someone check that. So you know, if you're going to pay him close to what his asking price is, you know that those things have been checked and they're not going to be for your cost within the next two to three years. And this was actually something, Michelle, that we did cover in one of our episodes mm -hmm. just this week, the importance mm -hmm. of having that um, inspection in uh, and understanding some of the things that might not be working in, on, in your property. Because um, the reality is with some of these properties, perhaps it was a rental unit and the owner generally wouldn't know what is wrong with it, mm -hmm. um, especially mm -hmm. because tenants don't always uh, say that this is what was wrong while I was saying here. Yeah? So the moment you are viewing a place, and I know I've never actually viewed a place where um, the, the report was already ready up front that said, these are the things that we are aware of that needs to be fixed. And we can either fix them or you're going to buy them knowing that these are uh, need fixing and perhaps we can use that to negotiate the price better. If anything, and I was even admitting this in, on yesterday's episode was that I've, I've been burnt a little bit with buying a property that wasn't thoroughly inspected and a couple of months later realizing that, oh, actually, this is something that was, you know, damaged before I even bought the property. And chances are the previous owner may or may have not known, but had I had an inspection in, um, then I would have probably known that this is something to flag and either have it fixed or make sure that I negotiate the price um, just further down. A few more questions coming in, Michelle. We've got one from Lena Davis who asks, is it a good idea to approach different agents to advertise for you? You see, I, I don't, I actually don't believe in that. I think the same way that you have a relationship with one person that you trust and you, you want to be with, that's kind of how you need to feel about your estate agent. 
you know, you need to decide, do you want the quickest sale or do you want the best sale? So if you're an estate agent, particularly in a difficult market, and someone has given you and four other people your property to sell, you do, you market the property, you work hard on it, but you'll take the first offer that someone gives you. You'll, you'll negotiate and you'll do your best for the seller. But in the back of your mind, you know all the time, well, you know, there's another agent at work here. At any minute, someone else can come in, put me to the post, and then that's it. Mm. You know, I don't have an opportunity anymore. So I think it's really important to commit to one estate agent. And I'm a big believer in working with someone who's an area specialist. The person who specializes in your area, because the areas do differ. You can't work the whole of the greater Johannesburg area and know all those areas. The areas differ. You need an area specialist. You need somebody who has a really good reputation. Um, if you want to, to interview a couple of agents and after that, knock on the door of someone who has a for sale board outside their house or a sold board by the agent that you've interviewed. That's the best way to know who you're going to be choosing. Um, and commit to that agent and sign their mandate and, and get the feedback and work with that person. And we find on a sole mandate we really find that the prices that the purchasers pay and the sellers get is better because there's a level of commitment and understanding that we, we, we conduct in business and everything's transparent. Um, you also want your property to be shown with one voice. You don't want five people showing five different views of what your property is about, what the price is, what it's offering. You want one message out there to the potential buyer and you want that message to be clear and concise and professional and it's actually interesting that you you say that you want your property to have one voice i mean i've seen with certain properties suppose they are listed for example by two or three, three different agents and the price is typically not the same price um, and sometimes i'll go to the one who's listed yep. it at the lowest price to actually see if I can't get it even lower and then go to the other one and establish if you can't go lower than the other one. So you're almost now trying to pit, you know, the various estate mm -hmm. agents against each other so that you get the best offer. So I suppose then as a seller, you're essentially shooting yourself in the foot because if as a buyer, I can already see your property listed by three different people and they're, they're, they're all willing to negotiate on price with me and I'm just out now to get the lowest possible price that I can um, I can get. I've got a few comments and some questions coming in. I'll start with a comment from Howard Mogetsano um, who asks, um, who comments rather, from the little that I've researched, the more the ads one, um, the more the ads, or the more there are ads on one property, the more the buyers immediately detect the sense of desperation and they'll take advantage of pricing the property down. So it's literally what I was saying just now. So different agents would have started that price battle with their different commissions to start with. Exclusive and sole mandate is the way to go. So really reiterating what you were saying there, Michelle. And okay. another one is from Dural Jafta who says, what if you're interested in a property that is in a good area, but the home looks in a bad state? but the seller wants a very high price and you know it's not worth that that much um, as there's a lot of work. How do you go about um, wanting, how do you go about wanting to purchase a property like that? Or do you just pass the look for something better? So I think that if something catches your eye in property, you know, property, if you're gonna live somewhere, it's an emotional bar. And to answer that gentleman who's asked that question, the position, position, position. You rather buy the best prop the worst property in the best area that you can afford because you can change everything about a house, but you can't move it to a different suburb. Mm. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I think it's always worthwhile to go and look at a property and to have a discussion with the estate agent and to ask them the questions. To say to them, the house really isn't in good condition. Do you have a disclosure document? Do you have an inspector's report? Has the seller had any offers on this property? How long has this property been on the market for? Those are the things as a buyer that will help you ascertain where the seller's head is. And if you really want the house and you see value at a substantially lower price, you are most welcome to put that offer in with the agent. The agent's job is to present that offer to the seller and the seller can then reject or accept it. Often if the price is just so far lower than what the seller accepted, they feel really insulted and they won't even entertain a counter offer. But you are most welcome to put an offer in at the price that you see and expect that you may, may get a counter offer back. 
So don't just walk away from the property because you think that the price is wrong. And I think particularly in the market that we're in now, um, we're going to find when this lockdown period is over, um, it's going to be very interesting to see the kinds of offers that will come in. I'm not saying that the market is going to tank or go down much further than what it is now. I don't know. We have to wait and see. Logic tells me that our interest rate is lower. People are going to be able to buy their dream house. They're going to be able to move in the area that they want, but they're going to do it at a price that suits them. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the things I've picked up along the way is sometimes just don't be scared to put in a cheeky mm -hmm. offer. Uh, you'd, be you, you'd be surprised how many sellers end up going for that cheeky offer and don't even do a counter offer. So I think uh, that's the tip that I've gone with when I really want a place and I think it might be overpriced, but put in that cheeky offer and it might seem like it's crazy because the asking <laughs> price is, is so high. Now, Michelle, before I let you go, you know, what, what kind of delays can people who've already uh, sold their property right now expect, given that you know we're in lockdown um, and that, for example, the deeds office is currently closed? What kind of delays are they actually looking um, at during this period? So there's a number of delays from the top to the bottom. So if we look at the top, the people who sold a number of months ago who are waiting for their property to register, the deeds office is closed. So the deeds office did really make an attempt to register as many properties that they had and they could register um, prior to lockdown. But obviously there are still properties that are busy in that process because it is a process, they can't rush it. The municipalities are closed, which means that even before the property gets into the deeds office, when an attorney transfers a property, they need a certificate of clearance for the electricity, the rates, the taxes. So the deeds office can't issue that. So there's a backlog on that. Um, moving further down, a person whose bond was granted and is now, the, you know, the, the attorney is awaiting guarantees. If they hadn't prior to lockdown gone and signed their bond documents, those guarantees can't be issued. So there's a delay there. Um, moving even, even further down to that, the person who has put an offer in during the lockdown period, the banks are a little slower than what they were previously. So all of those processes are moving more slowly. What's really interesting is that the vast majority of transferring and bond attorneys that we're doing business with are working virtually. So they're really doing as much of the process as they can. But documents do need to be signed in person by buyer and seller, and that you can't get past that. Um, the other thing, and in front of a commission of oath, so you can't get past that situation. The other thing is that the, the banks are working remotely. The bond originators are trying their best to work remotely and get documents in from purchases. Um, and estate agents are working remotely. So as much of the process as can be done is being done. But without the deeds office, the municipalities, the ability to sign documents, Unfortunately, guys, the process too is in lockdown. <laughs> you know, that's how it works. So the de delays are oh, you're a month behind on everything. And, and that's very true right now, Michelle. I mean, there's even, uh, you know, talks around the lockdown potentially being longer. So in the event where you find yourself um, being affected by this lockdown and those delays being in place, there's a possibility that it may actually be longer. Now, I... I sorry, can I, can I jump in there? There has been a request by the state agents, Wadi Rebosa, and by the various law societies and the bond originators of South Africa and various organisations, stakeholders in the real estate sector. They have, there have been requests to the minister to actually allow the deeds office and the municipalities to start working. Um, we're waiting to hear what the outcome is on that. There's nothing firm yet, but hopefully there will be a positive result on that. And, and you know, they will be able to work on skeleton staff and get at least those processes going. And we'll definitely be monitoring that. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us this evening. That was Michelle Cohan, who's the franchise owner for Leapfrog Johannesburg East. And she was joining us right here on episode 10 of the Private Property Podcast. Now, just to, you know, I'd already mentioned this earlier. Tomorrow, we will be talking about the costs associated with selling your home. So if you're looking at selling and you're not quite sure what the different costs are, then we'll be looking at that tomorrow. But on Friday, we're going to be having 
having Ask Private Property, where we'll be having a representative from APSA Bank. So if you have any questions, particularly around bonds, you know, whether it's, you know, difficulty or questions that you've always wanted to ask the financial institutions around that bond application process, what banks are looking for when they grant a home loan, or how do you go about getting a 100% home loan, then do send through your questions and we'll be sure to address them. That is on Friday after Friday evening, right here at seven o'clock, we'll be looking at Ask Private Property. So do send through those questions. That's it for me this evening on the Private Property Podcast. I hope that you are staying home and staying safe. And until tomorrow evening, uh, good night.